Welcome back. We've covered the small intestine. Now let's look at the large intestine. Um, it extends from the end of the ilium to the anus. Remember, duodenum, jejunum, and ilium. That's the part of the small intestine. So duodenum, jejunum, and ilium. And the parts of the large intestine, the largest part is called the colon. I'll introduce you to and show you the cecum as well as the rectum, which is the last part of the digestive tract. So in the middle, this is where the small intestine would be. So here is the end of the small intestine called the ileum, and here's the beginning of the colon. But this portion of it right here is called the cecum. It means blind pouch. Extending off the cecum is the appendix. It is lymphatic tissue. There's bacteria, good healthy bacteria in here. There's antibodies, there's B cells in here. It's part of the immune system. It also prevents people and uh, helps to prevent against um, colon cancer. So here is the ascending colon going up. Remember, food's going this way. Then it makes a turn. You got the transverse colon going across. And then you got the descending colon going down. So that's a big part of the picture frame. Ascending colon going up transverse colon going across, descending colon going down, and then this little curve, like the curve of an S, is the sigmoid colon. There's the sigmoid colon. And the lower six inches right here, that is the rectum. Now the turns right between the ascending colon and transverse colon they call it the hepatic flexure because hepa is liver. That's on the side of the liver. And on the other side, where the spleen is, they call it the splenic flexure. That's this curve. The other name for splenic flexure is just left colic flexure. And then there's a right colic flexure. They have interchangeable names. I like hepatic flexure and splenic flexure because that's where the organs are. Some people like to refer it based on the side of the body a right colic and a left colic flexure. These little bumps right here, these are called haustra. And then this right here, this band going up like this and all the way across, that's called the tinea coli. And I think those are the main structures that I wanted you to know anatomically. In terms of the appendix and appendicitis, um, if it does rupture, uh, antibiotics are typically given. Although I will say I did have a patient years ago that had it rupture, didn't know it ruptured, had a fever for a day. Two weeks later, went for a physical exam, told a doctor, you know, a few weeks ago, I had a little fever for one or two days, uh, but feeling fine, had a little stomach ache for about a day or two, but been feeling great since. Uh, they do his blood work. They see his white blood cell count is a little bit higher. They do an ultrasound and don't find an appendix. So they put it all together and realized he had a ruptured appendix. He did not die. And they gave him an antibiotic as a precautionary mem um as a precautionary measure. Uh, he probably didn't need it at that point in time. But, you know, the first time he told me this story, I said, you gotta be kidding me. I always thought that people die from this. So um, not in all cases, obviously. Okay, we mentioned the ascending colon. We talked about the transverse colon. We mentioned the splenic flexure. We talked about the descending colon, the sigmoid colon. And we spoke about uh, the rectum, the last six inches, and then the last portion is really the anus or the anal canal, which has sphincters that are involved, which is smooth muscles that can contract to, to, to control uh, bowel movements, okay? Um, the function of the large intestine is that it forms the feces primarily by reabsorbing water from the chyme. 
if there's too much water, then that's when you have diarrhea. If there's too little, then you have uh, constipation. There's very, very small amount of digestion that takes place in the large intestine. If any digestion takes place, it's primarily due to just the body's own bacterial action, breaking things down. Um, there's also some absorption of nutrients, but 15% of the total digestion and absorption of nutrients occur in the large intestine, only 15% of it. In terms of bacteria, good and bad bacteria, um, the colon contains different types of microorganisms. And some of them are good, and some of them could be bad. Um, the functions of the good bacteria, it allows the body to break down uh, nutrients, so it's involved in digestion, it prevents colon cancer. It's involved in producing B vitamins and vitamin K, especially B12. The bacteria can make B12 and the bacteria can make vitamin K, which is why when babies are born, they haven't eaten yet, the intestines are completely sterilized. They will inject the baby when the baby comes out with vitamin K in many states. Not all states, but some states require it by law. Um, vitamin K is needed for clotting. The K is um, uh, clotting and coagulation. Vitamin K, vitamin K helps with clotting. If you can't produce K, you're going to have clotting issues. So if a baby's environment is sterile, there's no bacteria and they can't produce vitamin K, if birth was traumatic and there's internal bleeding, the baby can't heal and clot properly. So they inject the baby with vitamin K. It's controversial. Some say you should, some say you shouldn't. Some say it leads to um, uh, uh, jaundice and the baby having to go under the infrared type of lights to help with the breakdown of blood cells. So it's kind of one of those uh, hot, hot topics today. Dysbiosis. That's when you have more bad bacteria than good, and it can result in bad breath or halitosis because the bad bacteria are releasing different gases. So most halitosis or bad breath isn't from poor dental hygiene. It's from bad bacteria in the gut, in the GI tract. This is what um, dysbiosis looks like. Looks like a pregnant belly, but it's not. Here's the chest. Here's the right leg, right here. That's the belly loaded with top. This is the size of the intestines that came out. This is tremendous. This is all toxic megacolon. This is all dysbiosis. When people have bellies like this, um, it's usually not fat. It's usually gases in there it, uh, coming from the dysbiosis. We've all seen people, especially sometimes you call it beer bellies, Again, all the yeast that's in there, right? All that, sorry, I'm having a trouble with my pen here. There's a delay in it. Uh, but all of this yeast, and it gives off all this bacteria and all this um, gases that come off from it. Okay, let's take a break right here.